Hello, 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 guys. Welcome, welcome, welcome to um, an impromptu live. Um, I actually had decided um, the live I did a while back was going to be my final one um, because I'd assumed I wouldn't have that much time. Okay, so um, I had done what I thought would be my final live um, for 2024. This was, uh, I'm not sure, maybe two weeks ago. But um, today I do have time, guys. And um, I couldn't resist trying to do a paper two practice, guys, okay, before I literally um, resume maybe one or two TikTok lives in 2025, okay? Obviously, guys, um, time is something that I don't really have very much of these days. That's why um, my lives are just here and there, few and far between, because I literally only have so much time before I... Um, literally have to do other things, right? So um, today I do want to look at paper two, okay? Because I do know and I am keenly aware of the fact that um, a lot of the uh, lives that I've done this term and in 2024 have literally only focused on paper one, right? And um, the reason is because obviously a lot of people really struggle on paper one, but I do know that there's a number of people that really struggle with paper two. And um, I know that obviously we're getting to the tail end of mock exams, but guys, especially if you're part of the class of 2025, guys, if you're in class of 2025 and you're getting to the tail end of your mock exams, you should not squander your Christmas break. Guys, if you're in year 11, if you're in year 10, you've got a bit more time. I do know that there's a lot of people that always lock into these lives. that are also part of my Sunday weekly masterclasses that are in year 10, right? You guys have a bit more time. You have the, the luxury of time. If you, you're in year 11, yeah, and you probably have heard this from your teachers, but guys, do not ignore your teachers when they say that you need to be locked in even Christmas time when the Christmas break comes around in maybe uh, two weeks, right? No, 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 three weeks. I'm completely getting my timings off. Guys, if you're in year 11, class of 2025, you're going to be doing your GCSE exams next year. You really need to start making use of the few remaining holidays that you've got to get on top of your weaknesses, to increase that reading speed, that writing speed when it comes to English. And one thing that I always recommend to my masterclass GCSE students, there's two books in particular that I've told all my um, masterclass students, those who really want to lock in and make the most of Christmas to get, which gets their ambitious language and vocabulary up. Guys, I'd like to suggest, please, um, get a copy of either Old Man and the Sea by Ernest Hemingway or John Steinbeck's The Pearl. These two books are amazing. They're really brief reads. They're less than 80 pages long. They have really rich and ambitious language and vocabulary. Of course, guys, for those of you that are still struggling and you're like, okay, I'm really, really bad at reading. I can't sit still. I really struggle with getting that ambitious language up. Guys, if you join my masterclasses every single week, I literally give a new ambitious vocabulary word to my students who increase that word bank okay in addition to obviously answering model responses for these locked papers now um some of you guys might actually be um part of my master classes already because i do know that there's a lot of people um from tiktok who are part of my master classes and up until uh, a week ago we had finished answering this locked gcse language paper one there was even somebody in my class who was like oh my god miss my mocks were literally exactly on this paper right so we went over and answered this 2024 paper now guys this coming sunday um we started on this last week we went through the paper to 2024 exam okay and um this sunday i'm going to be looking at section a so this is especially questions three and four of this 2024 paper and then my final masterclass before the christmas break i'm going to be looking at how to write a model essay for this 2024 locked paper okay this is a paper that students sat literally this june right and one thing that i'm going to be getting from my masterclass students from next january when we uh, resume is i'm going to be going over the resets so this is the resets that students sat at the start masterclass students from next January when we uh, resume is I'm going to be going over the resets. So this is the resets that students sat at the masterclass students from next January when we uh, resume is I'm going to be going off strong and also have off strong and also have revision material. You want to lock in 
of revision material. You want to lock in for Christmas time. You want to make sure that you have got those fundamentals right. You want to get that ambitious vocabulary. You want to get that practice and see the model essays, not only for this paper, but also past papers. So this is the 2023. You want to get that ambitious vocabulary. You want to get that practice and see the model essays, not only for this paper, but also past papers. So this is the 2023. You want to get that ambitious vocabulary. You want to get that practice and see the model essays, not only for this paper, but also past papers. So this is the 2023 this is within today's TikTok live. But what I do want to go over, guys, is this paper, which is a really interesting past paper in the sense that this was the um, I want to say it's a lockdown paper. Right. Because um, in 2020, we had the lockdown. Um, there were no GCSE exams. And this was the only paper that came out during that time. What I want to do today, um, because I'm going to be finishing this live at 6 p.m., is going over fundamentals and basics when it comes to language paper two. OK, so this is what you should um, anticipate. And not only if you're doing your mocks this term, but also, guys, as I said, especially if you're in year 11, I would really strongly recommend. And not only if you're doing your mocks this term, but also, guys, as I said, especially if you're in year 11, I would really strongly recommend. And not only if you're doing your mocks this term, but also, guys, as I said, especially if you're in year 11, I would really strongly recommend. Right. So this is basically you're going to be the second, the next lot of people who are going to be doing this. But instead of 2024, 2025, you only have Christmas, February half term, Easter, and that's it as your um, breaks. Right. So you need to try your best to lock in at every single Christmas and Easter and half term break to really get that reading and writing speed up. Because remember that English is a test of reading speed, writing speed, especially for language. So let's go over the fundamentals and the basics that I would recommend practicing afterwards, not only right after this live, but also during Christmas time. When you decide if you want to do really well, you want to get that six, seven, eight and nine in your final GCSEs and you want to increase that reading and writing speed. What are the fundamentals and the basics you need? to wrap your mind around when it comes to language paper two okay and as i said guys i'm doing this live because it literally occurred to me that um i barely look at paper two right i always jump on tiktok um random last minute jumping on and then i always do language paper one but what i wanted to do today um is paper two it's probably going to be my only paper two live maybe i did one live like ages ago um but i haven't done that many paper twos right but i want to go over some fundamentals some basics right and I'm going to be using this as an example. Of course, guys, for those of you that maybe want and need a little bit more direct support, you also want to see how to answer this entire paper and you want model answers, which I give to all of my uh, masterclass students. I will be going over the, this entire paper and you want model answers, which I give to all of my uh, masterclass students. I will be going over this 2024 paper two exam this Sunday. OK, you can literally click on the link in the bio. But what I'm going to be doing in the space of this hour, OK, until 6 p.m. is going over quick fundamentals and then picking one of the questions in this paper and answering them during this live. OK, let's talk about the fundamentals, the basics. What should you anticipate and when you are practicing? Yeah. So you decide to lock in. You want to do amazing. You want to make the most of Christmas. You go onto AQA's website. You download past papers. You want to practice. You want to do really well and get better in paper two. Guys, remember that you've got one hour, 45 minutes. And this paper is the nonfiction paper. You are given two nonfiction extracts, right? So you're always given a modern source, which is source A, and a Victorian source, which is source B. And what do you need to do for this paper? You need to, in the first uh, section, so this is in section A, you have got to answer four questions based on these two sources. Now, in terms of timings, this is how you should always manage yourself in terms of exam techniques. The four questions based on these two sources. Now, in terms of timings, this is how you should always manage yourself in terms of exam technique and in terms of managing your timings for this entire paper. For section A, guys, remember, you should always spend the first 10 minutes when you are practicing. And of course, also the first 
10 minutes is say you've got this as part of your mocks this month, right? Or even in December, to be honest. Spend the first 10 minutes of this exam. Firstly, getting a highlighter, reading the questions. Read the questions first in this order, right? You read question one, question two, question three, question four, and question five. Highlight the keywords, especially for questions one to four. And then afterwards, that should take you around 60 seconds, right? So you want to um, highlight and read question papers with your highlighter. And then the remaining roughly nine minutes, okay, this is why you want to work on your speed reading as well. Read the inserts. Do it in that order, okay? So always first begin by reading the questions first. Read the questions, get a lay of the land, especially for questions one to four. Then you read the inserts. And that's exactly what I'd been highlighting to my students during um, our first masterclass looking at this 2024 exam, which was last Sunday, right? We looked at the um, questions. We talked about what the questions anticipate, how to compare looking at this 2024 exam, which was last Sunday, right? We looked at the um, questions. We talked about what the questions anticipate, how to compare before then looking at the two inserts and then picking out the relevant information. This is a 2024 locked paper. Then afterwards, remember that question one, which is a multiple choice, you're not writing anything, right? You're just selecting statements that are true based on usually the modern source. Spend a max of five minutes on this question. Question two, which is your first commercial true based on usually the modern source. Spend a max of five minutes on this question. Question two, which is your first comparison question. It's worth eight marks to spend a max of 10 minutes on this question. What's really interesting with question two, and this is what I was talking to my um, group class um, about last Sunday, is with question two, because what we did towards the end is we looked at two separate student exemplars. One of the challenges with question two is because it's worth eight marks. But when we looked at the student exemplars and the students that got closer to seven or eight out of eight, and this is why I keep on emphasizing, guys, is if you're in year 11, you want to lock in. Yeah, you want to be practicing your speed reading and speed writing. Literally, the exemplars are shared with that class of marked past paper questions. This was the 2019 I shared with them. The students that consistently got sixes, sevens and eights out of eights literally wrote two comparison paragraphs. Right. This is a trend that I highlighted to my class that shows that examiners, even if you're answering this comparative question is worth just eight marks, examiners want to see not only depth in comparison, but also a nice chunky amount of writing. Guys, remember that with English, you can't get away with just writing shallow responses, even for eight mark questions. Again, guys, this is why it's so important with English, guys. You want to see it as something that you prepare um, for over a longer period of time and get faster because you want to write. One of the patterns I'm highlighting to my students is I always tell them, guys, let's look at actual past paper exemplars. Let's look at marked answers. And one of the things that comes up over and over again is the longer the answer, the more likely the student is to hit sixes, sevens, eights and nines. It's just that's just the way it is, guys. OK, and I have no words of comfort for people who are really slow writers. The only thing I can say is, guys, use and make the most of your Christmas break. And any breaks that you have to improve that writing and reading speed. Then question number three. This is a language question. It is worth 12 marks. You want to spend a max of 13 minutes on this question. And I'm going to be going over question three for the language 2024 paper two exam this Sunday. Okay, going over the language question that came up for this source, uh, for one of these sources either, even. And for question four, where you've got to now talk about and compare writers' viewpoints and perspectives, because remember, question two and question four ask you to compare. So there's also um, heavy comparison skills that are tested for this question, which is worth 16 marks, spent a max of 17 minutes on this question. And as I said, guys, this Sunday from 5 to 6 p.m., I'll be going over comparative writing and going over question three and four for this paper two exam. OK, so especially for those of you guys that have questions, comparative writing and going over question three and four for this paper two exam. OK, so especially for those of you guys that have questions that maybe want to see a little bit more. You maybe even want to have a model response that you can use as part of your revision. I'll be offering this to my students. Plus, we're also going to be reviewing student exemplars where I show my students, look, this is what a grade two and a grade three response looks like based on actual marked student papers. 
And this is what a grade seven, eight, and nine response looks like, okay? Before they then go off and then actually use that and practice that, okay? Then now, question five, which is section B, okay? And I'm also gonna be going over that in my mock and practice that, okay? Then now, question five, which is section B, okay? And I'm also gonna be going over that in my masterclass. This question tests your ability to write a letter, article, and speech. And it is actually this question I want to do today, yeah, in this live. This question, you're always given a topical issue, something that you need to show an opinion on and debate on. And you've got to write either a letter, article, or speech. Therefore, you need to show your awareness of form, okay? For this question, you want to spend around 50 minutes on this question. And this is the lion's share of this time available, okay? And one thing I want to mention as a final um, thing, which um, a lot of my students, and I mentioned this in my masterclass, yeah? So I'm just going to briefly go back to um, source A, something to pay attention to if you decide you want to get practicing with this paper. Guys, remember, and this is a little bit controversial to say, but it's true. With paper two, source A and source B, a lot of students tend to stress out that they'll read the modern text and be like, okay, I'll, tell you, I'll always understand the modern text, but when I'm given the Victorian text, I don't get what's going on. I only understand like one or two paragraphs and then I'm completely lost. Guys, remember that when it comes to your actual English GCSE and the amount of quotes you're going to be using in your written answers, you only use max 20% of the insert. What that means, and this is what I was telling my masterclass when we were going over this paper, okay, because we started going through it last week. What I was telling them is if you are reading, especially the Victorian text, right? And I feel like this Victorian text was like a little bit heavy. If you're reading the Victorian text, it's actually very normal to completely get lost in terms of what's going on in the text. That's normal. That's actually normal. And um, examiners appreciate that you're still in GCSE level, right? What you should not do is get caught up in the fact that you don't understand most of the text because really you're only going to use 20% of that text anyway in your answer. What you should do instead is focus on what you understand because even if you understand 100% of the insert, you're not going to use 100% of it. You're only going to use a small chunk of it. So if you are doing paper two, say for example, for your mocks, you may be practicing paper two and you always find that the Victorian source is the one that always lets you down. Oh my gosh, I can't. I always find that I have to read and reread the Victorian source. I totally don't understand everything. Guys, do not panic. You're only going to use 20% of the text anyway. So what you need to focus on is being able to write about the 20% that you understand. Guys, remember that when it comes to English, and this is a very controversial thing to say, but I strongly believe it. Teachers sometimes emphasize too much to students. Oh, you need to read the source and then reread it and reread it, understand it perfectly. I actually say it's the opposite. Read the parts that you understand and read the parts that are only relevant to answering the questions. That's why you want to highlight the questions. Pick only the paragraphs that you understand and write about them. Of course, the only limitation would be question three, where you've got to specifically focus on one part of the source, right? But aside from that, if you're reading the Victorian extract and you don't understand most of it, focus on the paragraphs you understand. Don't read and reread and waste all this valuable time reading. If you're reading the Victorian extract and you don't understand most of it, focus on the paragraphs you understand. Don't read and reread and waste all this valuable time reading and rereading and being like, I have to understand 100%. Because even if you understand 100% of these sources, you literally are only going to use max 20%. Yeah. And again, guys, for those of you that have questions about source section A, because I'm not going to be looking at section A today, I'm going to look at section B the letter article or speech. If you have questions, I'm going to be going over section eight in more detail. I even prepare a framework for my students that they can use for language paper two, as well as write model answers that I always share with my students that they can use as part of the practice. If you have questions, if you want to see how does that look like, what should I, how should I approach my speed reading and speed writing? I go over this in connection to this locked 2024 paper this Sunday at 5 p.m., okay? And um, as I mentioned, section B, I'm going to be going over that the following Sunday in connection to the 2024 exam. So guys, as I said, I always pop up in these lives. I don't have time to be um, answering loads of questions, but I tend to do that in my master classes. In fact, we're always overrun because I'm answering so many questions. But in these lives, I don't have time to be um, answering loads of questions, but I tend to do that in my master classes. In fact, we're always overrun because I'm answering so many questions. But let's have a look at this paper and more specifically, how to approach 
section B. Okay, so I've given you guys a run through of how to manage yourself. Say, for example, you've got your paper two mocks coming up next week or the week after, or you've maybe had your mocks, you've not done that well in paper two, and you want to lock in. Yeah, you want to get locked and loaded Christmas time. You're going to have that academic comeback in January. Come February, you've got this in the bag when it comes to English. And by the time Easter rolls around, this is just second nature, right? It's light work. You're going to be walking into that exam hall really confident. If you want to find yourself in that position, you need to follow these tips that I'm suggesting in this live. Yeah. So number one, when it comes to section A, obviously read the questions first, then look for information you're going to use in the insert. And don't stress out if you're reading the insert and you don't understand most of it. You're not going to use most of it anyway, right? Like you're literally only going to use max 20%. That's what's so challenging about English. You have to learn so much stuff. This is also the same for literature, right? You learn a whole book and then you only use one scene from that book, right? That's what can make it very challenging. You just don't know what's going to come up. The same goes for the inserts, okay? If you only understand 20%, perfect, because you can use 20% of that insert to answer the questions for section A. And as, as I said, guys, I'm not going to look at section A in this um, live. I'm going to look at this question today. But for those of you that have questions, for those of you that I'd like to have a bit more, right, you might need some guidance. You want to see maybe, okay, um, I did my mocks in paper two, but I really failed in terms of AO2. Or I did my mocks, but I was told my answers were not evaluative enough. Um, I wasn't comparing enough. I'm going to be going over that. And I answer student questions. I always overrun by like 15, 20, even 30 minutes because my students who join in those classes have so many questions, right, which I always answer. We even go over student exemplars. If you want that direct support, I'm going to be going over that and offering this this Sunday from 5 to 6 p.m. OK, so if you want to, you can obviously sign up using the link in the bio. Now, as I said, let's look at question number five. You're always given a topical statement. Topical statement means you're asked to consider an issue and debate. And remember, guys, when you're answering question five, you need to show that you can debate and consider both sides of an argument or an issue. OK, you also need to show that you have a clear line of argument for your perspective. Now, looking at this statement, the statement says people have become obsessed with traveling even further and faster. OK, this is to do with traveling. However, travel is expensive, dangerous, damaging. A foolish waste of time. That's the statement. It's to do with traveling, how people, you know, really love traveling, but it's a foolish waste of time. And then you're asked to write an article for a news website in which you argue your point of view on this statement. Guys, remember that with this question, you're always only ever going to be asked to write an article, letter or speech. And again, guys, not only do you need to show an awareness of debating skills, writing persuasively, transactional writing, but also you need to skills, writing persuasively, transactional writing, but also you need to show an awareness of form. If you're asked to write an article, you need to show that this is an article. I need to have things like headlines, subheadings. I need to make the opening really catchy. If I'm writing a letter, I need to lay out the uh, letter in a letter-like format. Same for speech. Again, guys, I have a framework that I always share with my students, which literally has um, seven step guides for each of these forms. OK, so of course, guys, this is also part of the masterclasses that I do offer to all my students if you want those frameworks. OK, now let's look at this particular question. How do I make sure I am answering it in a way that really maximizes the marks that I can get from this and puts me in an amazing position to get close, if not full marks on this question. If I secure the 40% or even the 50% of marks available for this question, answering the rest of the paper in section eight is then going to be light work. I'm already in strong, stable grade six territory. All I just now need to do is bring it home, take it up to seven and an eight, even a nine with my question four response and my question two response. Okay. So it's really important to get question five, right? And by the way, guys, if at this stage, and this is something that I always get from my students, I always say, oh, I'm always running out of time. I'm running out of time. I really struggle with timings. I really struggle with timings. Miss, how can I improve myself in terms of timings? How should I approach my mocks? How should I approach my exam? Guys, if timings is an issue, right? So if you're looking at this time um, suggestion and you're like, I literally cannot be able in one hour, 45 minutes to do all of that stuff. I always run out of time. 
always remember to start with question five. Question five and four, okay? So make sure you secure the two biggest marks. If you even, in theory, get four marks in question five, you have literally put yourself in solid um, upper grade five or lower grade six territory, right? So literally, if you even just do a solid five question and you get close or as close as possible to full marks, you are already in low grade six territory. You then just bring it home by answering question four, doing really well on that, and then question two. I am not advocating not answering all of the questions, but for those of you who struggle with timings, this should be top priority, okay? By the way, guys, just to be clear, do not go away from this live and say, Oh, first rate tutor said I can only get away with answering one question. Don't say that. I didn't say any of that. Okay. If you do that and then you start failing, that's on you. But I'm saying if you struggle with timings and you always find that you run out of time for the big mark question, work backwards. Okay. So let's look at this question and let's look at how to approach any kind of question five response. Remember guys, with this question, as I said, you're always asked to talk about a topical issue. What this means is you are tested on your ability to debate and to show your opinion and counter arguments on stuff that you hear about in the news, in the radio and so on. OK, so say I've got this question. How should I approach this question and this statement? I need to be able to not only fulfill a primary purpose of answering this question, right? So showing my perspective, my side of the argument, blah, 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 which is primary purpose. And of course, part of the primary purpose is also showing an awareness of form. I equally need to make this writing entertaining and engaging for my reader, which is what we call the secondary purpose purpose of any non-fiction or transactional writing. People always fulfill the primary purpose, right? So they're given a topical statement, they're given a non-fiction letter, article, speech. And then they start by saying, in this article, I will talk about this. This is what I believe. I think, no, 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 no. I think that. I hope you've really enjoyed my article. So they've maybe answered the primary purpose. They've maybe debated. But then because they started by saying, in this article, in this letter, in this speech, they're already sending the audience to sleep. They're boring. They are not fulfilling the secondary purpose, which is also to make the writing compelling. OK, guys, remember that with question number five, a lot of people forget that even if this is nonfiction writing, you are still using very similar writing skills, very similar engaging writing skills as creative writing in paper one, question five. You need to have your rhetorical question. You need to have alliterative devices. When you're opening your letter, article or speech, do not ever, ever start with in this article, I will in this letter, I will. In this speech, I will. That's boring. You're sending your audience or your readers to sleep. You need to start maybe with a rhetorical question, maybe with repetition, maybe with some form of conflict that is equally fulfilling both the primary purpose, which is to inform, entertain, educate, but also the secondary purpose. People always think that question five is easy, light work, and they then walk away after the mocks and then they look at the mocks and they're like, oh my God, how the hell did I get 19 out of 40? Why am I stuck on 12 out? Out of 40. Well, you're stuck on 12 out of 40 because you've literally just approached this like any other essay. You are not supposed to approach question five like any other essay. You need to still make it entertaining as well as also informative. Now, how do you do so? How you approach this type of question is firstly decide which side of the argument you're going to stand on. It's always good for this type of question, by the way, guys, especially for those of you maybe that are used to kind of arguing both sides, right? Arguing to an extent, maybe you're doing history, maybe you're doing one of those humanities topics where you argue to an extent. Try to take a black and white view. Try to take a yes or no view, because if you decide I'm going to fully agree or fully disagree, you can then have really nice and conflicting and very clearly conflicting arguments, okay? This is really important, guys. Remember that this is not a history article. This is not one of those articles where you've got to show like you agree to an extent and disagree. Make your life easy. Have either black and white, yes or no. So for example, in this case, I'm going to say that I disagree. So I'm going to take a no perspective. I don't agree that people have become obsessed with traveling further, faster, and travel is expensive, dangerous, and damaging. So I'm going to say that no. My side of the argument is I disagree. Meaning when I am making my arguments, firstly, because I've taken a black and white approach, it's really clearly 
obvious to my examiner exactly what side of the argument I take, right? That's number one, rather than looking like I'm conflicting in my arguments. But also if I take a black and white approach, guys, what that means is when I am arguing the counter perspective, I can show some really interesting points of conflict, which makes my article letter or speech entertaining. And in this case, it's an article, meaning it's got to start with a headline, um, opening paragraph, first subheading, main body paragraphs, where I've got my made up anecdote statistics, counter arguments, as well as my closing statement. Now, I would recommend if you are aiming for a seven, eight or nine, you should have three perspectives for your, for your point in your black and white discussion, in this case, a black and white article, and then two counter arguments. And in both sides, you need to include a uh, anecdote which is basically Sally Smith in year 11 is um, affected by this specific issue, right? Remember, anecdote is someone who's affected by the specific issue you're talking about. Use that to reinforce your argument. You also need to have a made up statistic. And also, um, what's the other one? A made up uh, uh, examples, right? So maybe examples of, you know, the scenarios or the cases that you're talking about, right? So if I'm looking at this, why would I disagree that traveling, you know, um, people are obsessed with traveling? Well, people, you know, tr um, people's interest in traveling is legitimate, right? So what that means is actually people wanting to travel is really healthy, right? It's not an obsession. It's actually healthy. And I'm going to say that actually far from being dangerous, expensive, damaging, and a foolish waste of time, actually, you know, people's interest, which is legitimate, by the way, guys, I'm writing in shorthand, okay? Never write words like legit, okay? Write legitimate. Also, of course, guys, remember that you're using ambitious language and vocabulary. Anyway, why am I saying this? Why is this interesting? And how does this go against this idea that traveling is expensive, dangerous, damaging, and a foolish waste of time? Well, traveling is enlightening, okay? It makes us less prejudiced, right? We don't um, say, oh, this person is from this background, therefore they are like this. The more you travel, maybe you believe that people from specific country you know, um, are like this, right? Um, I've watched Narcos. Uh, I know that this is quite an old Netflix show, right? But say, for example, some people will say, oh, I've watched Narcos, Narcos Mexico, Narcos Colombia, blah, blah, blah. Therefore, everybody from Latin America is somehow involved in the drug trade. That is a very negative prejudice. Then you give yourself a chance to actually go to Mexico, Colombia or Latin America, and you go and see, actually, there's a lot of people who are working really, really good jobs, very honest jobs. And therefore, traveling far from being expensive, damaging, and a foolish waste of time is actually really important in improving people's stereotypes, right? And here I'm going to argue and make up a statistic, made up statistic, that according to Cambridge University, um, well-traveled people have at least five foreign friends. They don't see people as like these scary, different other people, right? So um, well-traveled people have five foreign friends by the way guys this is a plan always remember also guys when you are writing your response to question five you need to set aside at least 10 minutes to planning your response that is sacred that's really important because you then have a very easy and clear line of argument that's easy for your teacher or your examiner to follow it's always immediately obvious when teachers are answering scripts or rather when teachers are reading answered scripts, which student has planned their response and which hasn't. Because the students that haven't planned the response, they just dive into the answer. They're writing anything and everything that comes to their heads. Those that plan already going into writing their essay have a very clear structure and a clear line of argument. Make sure for question number five, okay, so I suggested with question five, spend around 50 minutes on this question. Always spend of this 50 minutes, the first 10 minutes planning your response, and then 40 minutes actually writing out your response, okay? Question Always spend of this 50 minutes, the first 10 minutes planning your response and then 40 minutes actually writing out your response, okay? Why else would I disagree with this statement? Is traveling always expensive? Well, no, because budget airlines have made traveling cheap. And here I'm going to give various examples of budget airlines like Wizz Air, Ryanair, um... Um, EasyJet, who prove that travel can actually be quite cheap, far from dangerous, 
and not a foolish waste of time. That's going to be my second reason why I go down this line of argument. I am refusing. Now, the third reason why I would say that I disagree completely with this statement, right? Because I'm making a very black and white argument. I can then juxtapose and contrast it with my counter arguments is this, that travel is actually a great use of our time rather than a foolish use of our time. And I'm going to use my made up anecdote of Sally Smith, who is in year 11 and she learned f- um, more French and she learned French fluently in four weeks of summer school in France, maybe in Paris, than a whole year in school. So this is my plan for my perspective. Why? I believe that I disagree with this statement, okay? However, what do I need to do to make this writing, this transactional nonfiction writing persuasive? I need to also show why people disagree with me. Guys, for those of you that are doing humanities topics, if you're doing history, if you're doing, um, history is the one that really comes to mind because I usually find that especially history students are the ones that always want to argue to an extent yes but also no so they always want to mix the yes and no arguments in the same paragraph i would like to recommend do not take that approach when it comes to english because with history that is part of the structure and the framework that you frame any historical argument in english you're not being tested on the same skills as history you're just being tested on number one your ability to engage with this number two are you can you show an awareness of form number three are you able to fulfill both the primary purpose of this writing as well as the secondary purpose which is making it entertaining. If you make it super easy for your examiner and your teacher to see what your line of argument is, i.e., okay, I'm going to completely disagree or completely agree, then you make it easy for them to then, once they see your perspective, why people will disagree with you, which is what we call our counter arguments, then you make it extremely easy for them to award you as close to these four marks as possible because you're showing your full range of debating skills. Not only are you presenting your perspective, but also you're showing that you can consider why people would disagree with you. What would be my two counter arguments? Okay, so I'd suggest maybe doing three arguments for your perspective, two counter arguments. Well, some people who'd say that actually, yes, people have been become obsessed with traveling further, even faster, and traveling is indeed expensive, dangerous, damaging, and a foolish waste of time. Some people would argue that yes, this is true because travel is expensive especially if you're somebody who has you know a large family and um small pay maybe you're working class right maybe and i'm going to use an anecdote maybe you're john doe who's um working right so this is something that's been talked about lots in the news on tv we hear about the cost of living crisis right so cost of living People are saying life is way too expensive in the UK today. And maybe John Doe is a single father of five who can't afford travel, right? Definitely what he demonstrates is travel is indeed quite expensive and it can be quite damaging, for example, to family budgets, right? So he's a family man of five. And who, uh, what could be my second counter argument to this perspective, right? Because I'm juxtaposing, I'm creating some kind of conflict. Well, actually, de- travel can also be very dangerous for young people who are unaccompanied, right? And um, maybe a statistic could be, a made-up statistic could be that gov.uk the UK's official government website. This is totally made up. You can make up all of these things, right? You're just using it to back up your argument. They found that, you know, people um, under 21 are more likely, or maybe 70% more likely to get kidnapped. Also, guys, I am aware that my handwriting can be a little bit all over the place, right? I know that not everyone can understand my handwriting. And again, guys, just to be clear for those of you that might be wondering, oh, you see in your masterclasses on Sunday, do you handwrite everything, right? Maybe I'm struggling a little bit with your handwriting. Will I have to read your handwriting some more? Guys, I always type up all of my model essays and my model responses because I'm aware that my handwriting is kind of like a little bit sometimes squiggly, right? Um, I'm left-handed and I kind of want to try and keep my this page straight. And that's why my handwriting gets very squiggly, right? Because 
because really as a left-handed person I'd rather do that but of course obviously I'm trying to do this live and handwriting it okay but obviously guys rest assured for those of you that are interested in potentially joining in this Sunday masterclass where I go over paper two the June 2024 paper all my model answers are typed up, okay? Because I do know that not everybody can read my handwriting, okay? I'm a lefty and um, lefty, by the way, in terms of my handwriting, okay? Okay, because I do know that not everybody can read my handwriting, okay? I'm a lefty and um, lefty, by the way, in terms of my handwriting, okay? Not maybe political um, leanings, but um, yeah. Anyway, let me stop waffling. Let's get to it. Let's write a model response. How could we answer this question model answer for question five remember guys for those of you that struggle with timings you need to especially if you are doing paper two okay so maybe you are going to be doing your paper two mocks next week or even in december maybe perhaps you have just done your paper two mocks and you did kind of poorly right so maybe the marks that you got are pretty much kind of like grade three maybe grade four grade five territory and you're like where did i go wrong potentially you even ran out of time in question number five this is how to bring this back this is how to improve and this is what i'd like to recommend if you are keen on using Christmas to lock in, this is what you need to do. Download paper two past papers and then apply the stuff that I suggest, especially for question number five, okay? That's one of the questions that's the easiest to really start bumping up your marks the more you get used to writing faster and answering and debating and making it not only interesting, but entertaining, okay? So as I said, guys, this is an article. And in terms of an article, by the way, guys, remember that in an article... Uh, I'm running out of space. Okay, so I'm going to squeeze an article, how an article should be laid out right here, right? So what should an article layout be like? You should always start with a headline. That's step number one. Then you need to have an opening paragraph. Then <clears throat> step number three is your first um, subheading because you want to show an awareness of form. Then step number four is your main points, which is all this stuff. Then step number five is your second subheading to break up the text and make it easy for your reader's eyes to glide over. Then your second, your sixth step is your counter arguments, why people will disagree with you. Then you finish off by closing your argument, final paragraph, and that's it. And remember, you're not saying in this article, I will, in this letter, I will, in this speech, I will, because it's boring. It's sending your readers or listeners to sleep, depending on what you're writing. And in this case, it would be sending your readers to sleep. How should you begin your opening? Uh, how should you open your article? Well, firstly, you need to start off with your headline to indicate that this is an article, something short, sweet, snappy, use keywords from the question. Are um, or even is travel a waste of time the easiest way to have a headline in an article is take any of the keywords within the question or the statement turn it into a rhetorical question easy so now you're done with your first step of your article the headline now with the opening paragraph i'm going to go into engaging with this statement but also showing my perspective very clearly right so um, there are, so now because I know that I'm going to disagree with this statement, I am going to show people's contrary perspective, right? So I'm going to start off with the people who I disagree with. Then I'm going to say, I disagree before presenting my counter argument to create a sense of conflict. There are a multitude of people. I need to use ambitious language and vocabulary. Okay. There are a multitude of people who um, believe we as a society are obsessed with travel. They would say it is damaging, foolish, a waste of time. I have shown the contrary perspective, the perspective I'm about to start arguing against. Now I'm going to create some kind of conflict to show that I disagree. And really, I make it as simple by saying, yet I disagree. What have I done so far? I have added a mix of long and short sentences. 
I have also done a little bit of listing and now I'm about to show my perspective. Travel, um, we are not obsessed with travel. In fact, we are open-minded and rightly um, curious of our planet. Travel can be inexpensive, which means cheap. It is definitely um, safe and it is a mistake to believe that it is a foolish waste of time. Travel changes our lives. I have opened in my opening discussion by firstly showing the contrary perspective, the arguments, uh, the side of the argument I'm going to go against, said I disagree, then flipped it and said why I actually disagree. I have created conflict. I have not started by saying, in this article, I will. In this letter, I will. In this speech, I will, because I'm still trying to make sure I'm fulfilling both the primary purpose, which is to inform my reader, and the secondary purpose, which is to entertain. Now that I'm done with step number two, which is my opening paragraph, I'm now going to go into my first subheading, which is where I'm going to introduce why traveling is um, important. And actually, what I'm going to do in this... Um, uh, whoops, I think TikTok is asking me to verify myself. Let's see. So, um, okay, I think I verified myself. Hopefully you guys can hear me and still see me. Anyway, um, right. So as I said, guys, step uh, number three is now I'm going to add my subheading, break up the text a little bit and make it easy for my reader's eyes to glide over. And I'm also showing an awareness of form because it's an article. Yeah. So my first subheading would be travel is critical travel is important subheading done step number three out of the way yeah so i'm following the steps of an article again guys for those of you that have questions for those of you that are like okay actually is it possible to have a bit more I, I, i've missed the first part of the life oh my gosh i don't know where you know what are you talking about blah blah blah, blah this and that guys if you want a little bit more and you need maybe perhaps even guidance on how to approach the entire paperwork, uh, sorry, <laughs> paperwork, the entire paper, right? I have created a framework for language paper two. This is questions one to five. And also each Sunday I go over this paper. So this Sunday I'm going to be going over paper two. And in the final masterclass before I take a Christmas break, I'm going to be looking at a question also, each Sunday, I go over this paper. So this Sunday, I'm going to be going over paper two. And in the final masterclass before I take a Christmas break, I'm going to be looking at question number five. So if you want specific, if you have specific questions, right? Because I also talk with my students, it's highly interactive. If you this question and then I'm um, out, okay? So of course, if you have any questions, okay, you want maybe something a bit more specific. Maybe you want like actually to see a model answer, maybe even student exemplars. I literally offer that to my students in my Sunday masterclasses every Sunday, okay? Um, at 5 p.m. Anyway, so now I have done step number three. So now I'm going to go into my main points and I'm going to make my argument, my debate, my article compelling, convincing. I need to make sure I have at least one anecdote, one statistic, one made up example. They can be real life, but they can also be made up. Okay. Actually, examiners and teachers don't care about whether they're real life or made up. They just care that you understand a debate to be more compelling and convincing. They then uh, a debate must have at least one um, convincing statistic and one convincing anecdote. Okay. So now I'm going to go into my first reason why actually I disagree with the statement. It is a, um, a mistake to say that we are obsessed with travel. We are traveling more we are traveling more 
because we are curious to learn more about each other. This is not an obsession. It is a strength. This, um, in fact, actually, I'm going to add indeed, right? So now here I'm going into my first argument, right? People's interest is legitimate and um, travel is important because we still suffer from too many negative stereotypes. Think about it. Right? So now here I'm talking to my reader directly. I'm using an imperative sentence. Think about it. Um, how many people directly? I'm using an imperative sentence. Think about it. Um, how many people from countries? So think about it. How many people from countries like Iceland, now here I'm going to think about the most obscure countries. Um, how many people from Iceland, from countries like Iceland, um, Turkmenistan, Turkmenistan, these are actual all legit countries, right? So think about it. How many people from countries like Iceland, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, or Central African Republic do you no rhetorical question okay um if there's anyone from this these countries well um i hope more people know about you right but i'm using this as an illustration of actually the more we travel the more maybe we might have less and fewer stereotypes about people like this okay um you may have some negative ideas about these countries in fact many of us suffer from narrow minded ideas about foreign people travel this is i'm going to use a metaphor this is a disease travel can cure this can cure this so i've used an extended metaphor i'm saying that actually when we have negative stereotypes about people when we um, are narrow-minded about other people this is a mental disease right so i'm saying it's a disease that travel can cure so i'm using an extended metaphor indeed cambridge university found cambridge university found that people who travel are 70 percent more likely to be open-minded and have five foreign friends alliteration i'm using all of these techniques that come into creative writing, rhetorical question, long and short sentences, um, alliteration, metaphorical language. People always make the mistake and think that we only use that in question number five for paper one, right? So for example, with my masterclass, when I went over the paper one 2024 paper, right? There were lots of metaphors. Lots of people naturally assume that question number five for this paper, you're going to have metaphors. You're going to have alliteration, blah, 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 all of that, right? But actually... Also with paper two, right? When I go over this paper, you're going to have metaphors. You're going to have alliteration, blah, 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 all of that, right? But actually, also with paper two, right? When I go over this um, paper two response of my students, for this paper, this is a June 2024 on Sunday, I'm literally going to also emphasize and make the case that you need to still bring those creative devices, that creative writing element into your nonfiction writing. That's what makes it entertaining. That's what makes it informative. And that's what makes it engaging. You must include that as well 
in paper two. People always just, you know, they look at question number five, they're like, oh, this is light work. I'm just going to write, um, yeah, in this article, I'm going to do this. And then they just write loads of statements, just a whole load of statements. And it's boring. There's nothing that makes it engaging. There's no rhetorical question that's making our readers feel like they may be triggered to see things from a different perspective. There's also no use of inclusive pronouns, right? Things like you, we. You need to, you know, merge all of that into your question number five in the same way that you do that with question five for creative writing. You're still bringing those skills into this paper. That It's a very, very common misunderstanding that students have that, oh, I don't need to do anything creative, right, creative for this. You still need to make it creative and original. And guys, if you look at the mark scheme for question number five, literally the same wording is used for AO5, which is tested, and this is where you get the 24 out of the 40, and AO6. Examiners and teachers are looking for the same creativity, the same ambitious language, the same use of things like metaphors, alliteration, mix of long and short sentences in this question for paper two, as much as they are looking for this in paper one. Okay. So don't make the mistake of saying, oh, this is easy. Light work, light work, light work. I'm going to cook. I'm going to cook. Oh, I'm just going to write whatever comes to mind. It's easy. Don't do that. Okay. You still need to add those elements in this question. Rant over. Let's look at my second point. How do I elaborate on this? Okay. So point number two, this is to do with how actually it's wrong to say that travel is expensive. I am engaging with my statement, okay? Um, others maintain that travel is expensive. It damages our pockets. Okay, so here I'm basically also engaging with that reference to damaging. By the way, I'm talking about our incomes, right? Or maybe, you know, um, our parents' incomes or whatever. So I'm also using synecdoche or for those people who are very posh, I'm saying synecdoche, right? So I'm using all of that creative language and that vocabulary to bring my article to life. Now I'm going to develop this, okay? Um, travel can be as cheap or as expensive, I'm using oxymoron, opposite language, um, as we want it to be. Um, in need of a luxury experience, book first class flights to Dubai. Yet, if you are simply looking for a quick getaway, get away, you can just as easily spend £20 on a weekend flight to Rome, Paris, or um, what's a really nice Berlin? I'm using rule of three. In fact, budget airlines, airlines like, now here I'm giving my examples, Ryanair, Wizz Air, and EasyJet have made traveling cheap. So now I have addressed my second perspective. Now I'm going to go into my third reason before I consider my counter arguments. Okay. So now here I'm saying that actually travel is definitely not dangerous or a foolish waste of time. Okay. So here I'm saying actually it's a great use of our time. Um, it is um, preposterous ambitious language. It's preposterous. It's outrageous, right? To say that our itchy feet and our longing to visit tr uh, distant lands is an obsession. 
right? I'm engaging with both parts of the statement saying that, oh, um, people are obsessed with traveling fast, faster. I'm saying that that's, a, that's preposterous. That's a silly statement. That's an outrageous statement. Now I'm going to go into why it's not a foolish waste of time. It's definitely not dangerous, right? Travel can be educational, right? So again, I'm contrasting my long sentences with my short sentences, changing up the pace of my writing. Um, it is an excellent use of our time if we are learning foreign languages. Now here I'm going to introduce Sally Smith, my anecdote, my made up person, right? Anecdotes are really powerful because you then really humanize that example, right? So instead of saying, oh, statistically 50%, okay, 50% is great, but we can't imagine 50% of people. But what we can do is imagine Sally Smith is in year 11 who travels to France to, um, you know, learn the language, right? Which helps her in her French GCSEs. That's why anecdotes are so powerful. Imagine Sally Smith is in year 11 who travels to France to, um, you know, learn the language, right? Which helps her in her French GCSEs. That's why anecdotes are so powerful, right? Um, so it's an excellent use of um, time. Let us, this is a great way of introducing anecdotes. Let us consider the case of Sally Smith, right? Sally Smith. Um, last summer, she joined a four week summer school in Paris to learn intensive French as she did terribly in her year 10 GCSE French mocks, right? So now here, I'm then gonna say, in just four short weeks, she was fluent now in year 11 in year 11 she is on course to get a grade nine in french done i have made my argument as to why travel is actually not far from being, you know, something that's a negative obsession. It's actually, you know, um, the opposite of being a foolish waste of time. It's actually really good. You can become good in learning languages, blah, blah, blah. So now I'm done with step number four in my article. Um, the opposite of being a foolish waste of time. It's actually really good. You can become good in learning languages, blah, blah, blah. So now I'm done with step number four in my article. Okay, so I'll start off my headline, my opening paragraphs, my subheading. Then I've developed my main points. Now I'm going to first add another subheading to break up the text to remind my reader and my examiner and my teacher of form before I then add my counter arguments, then wrap up by adding the concluding paragraph. So now I'm going to um, show that travel is damaging very nice and brief counter arguments now i'm going to introduce because i have black and white arguments it's so easy now for my teacher to see that i'm transitioning into considering why people will disagree with me a good way to talk about people who disagree with you you want to say that they are naysayers yeah so now i'm going to start off with you know why travel can actually be expensive yet naysayers would criticize my romanticized view of travel. It is an illusion to say travel is cheap for everyone. In our current, so now here I'm talking about like a topical issue, cost of living crisis, cost of living crisis, um, parents can barely afford to keep a roof over their children's heads much less take them 
away to fancy holidays. Fancy holidays. And now I'm going to transition into my first counter argument, which is um, my made up anecdote. John Doe, who's a family man of five who like, you know, is basically working on minimum wage, definitely can't afford travel. It's, you know, definitely a foolish waste of time. And it's also too expensive for him. Um, consider John Doe, John Doe. He is a family man of five who works a minimum minimum wage travel is expensive and out of the question for him and his family okay and then now i'm going to transition into my second counter argument why travel can be dangerous equally Travel is extremely dangerous for young people. There are many horror stories. There are many horror stories, horror stories of young people. Horror stories, horror stories of young people who have gone missing abroad. They have vanished, vanished, never to be seen again, vanished, never seen again. Right. So now here I'm going to say, um, you know, a made up statistic gov dot UK found that people who are under 21 years of age are 70 percent more likely to get kidnapped, kidnapped abroad. And that's my counter arguments done. Now, because I'm done with my subheading and my counter arguments, I need to just simply finish off my discussion to say, okay, I have considered why people disagree with me. I have also set out and laid out my perspective, reason one, two, and three, why I disagree with this statement. I've made it really nice and black and white so that it's easy for my teacher. I'm literally holding my teacher's hand. I'm saying, hey, miss, hey, sir, let me hold your hand. Let me show you exactly where my argument is going. Okay, now you can clearly see my perspective. Now you can see why people have disagreed with me. I have shown you really great debating skills. However, I'm not going to stop short of just saying these counter arguments. I need to now close my discussion. Even if I've considered why people agree with me, why people see my perspective, actually, I still think I'm right. And again, guys, don't forget that um, before I wrap up today, if you want to see this, and also I know that, you know, my handwriting becomes a little bit chicken scratches towards the end, right? Guys, remember that I'm going to be going over and typing up responses for this paper, okay? So this is the June 2024 exam that students sat. I'm going to be answering this with my masterclass students, okay? Especially for those of you guys that maybe have questions that are like, actually, I'd really like a little bit more. I'd like maybe a framework. I would like to know if I can download these model answers and use them over Christmas, right? So I really want to make the most of my Christmas break. Um, I'll be going over this. Uh, this Sunday at um, 5 p.m. Okay, so for those of you that kind of desire a little bit more, I'm going to be going into that in more detail. So let's wrap up with the closing discussion. This is how you close a letter, article, or speech. That being said, great way instead of saying in conclusion right so don't write this as if it's an essay it's not an essay it's supposed to be an article letter or speech it is still engaging for your reader primary purpose to inform secondary purpose to entertain that being said traveling is not a waste of time it is not foolish it is not damaging or dangerous travel is important traveling 
opens our minds and cures us of our prejudices. Travelling can even teach us new languages. We must become citizens of the world. The next time someone says you are too obsessed with travel or with traveling, tell, tell them you are too narrow minded and that is it okay and guys as i said today answering question five but of course for those of you that want to see the full paper answered in more detail i'm going to be going over this paper two this sunday at 5 p.m okay so i'm going to be going over both section a in fact in my class we've already started on section a and um also section b and my classes, obviously, not only do I write the model answers and share it with all of my students, but they also get access to past lessons. OK, so I've already done um, the 2023 papers that all of my students have access to, which you would have if you joined in. Right. This is the Sunday masterclass that I have every Sunday. There's only two more left this term before Christmas. OK, and then what I'm obviously going to do when I resume in January is... Um, Start off with the reset papers, okay? So I'm going to get my pause on the November reset paper and I'm hoping that myself and my students are going to be going over that um, as of, when are we going to be doing that? From the first week of January. And we're going to be having literally weekly masterclasses all the way to um, GCSE, okay? And actually my goal for all of my students in those classes is for them to get minimum, walk away minimum with sevens, eights and nines, okay? Literally, I believe any student, if they apply themselves if they are consistent, literally, regardless of learning disability, okay, learning difficulties, I've literally had students who have really, really bad dyslexia, who have still gotten those sevens, eights and nines, okay, so I believe it's completely possible, it's just with English, you've got to give yourself time, okay, you've got to give yourself that leeway and that room, it's not something, English is not something you wake up, like, a week before your exams, and you're like, do you know what, I've got to, like, stay and pull all-nighters, guys, you cannot learn, um, speed reading, speed writing, language structure, writing persuasively, all of that stuff overnight. Okay. It's something that you've got to do over a longer stretch of time. And that's why I do these on a weekly basis. Okay. Anyway, guys, so thank you so much for joining in. I'm going to head off. And, um, for those of you,